Man, yeah, just wear the beanie. That's it. That's pretty solid. I feel good about that. That's a good way to start this. Get the attitude up high, you know. Go trade two J's if you could become Wolverine. Where are you getting all this information? I definitely heard some some rumors about it. Are you still going? For, I, I can't get goosebumps thinking about it because it's like you can hear them get the car. I was going to qualify and I was going to drive it out the racetrack. Just threw the hood over the ditch and longest employee of Knox. You did some digging there, huh? I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, tickets are on sale for FD, and uh, I get a way that you can save a little bit of money. So when you're buying your tickets right before checkout, there's a little box that says like coupon code. Put in FD podcast, boom, saved you some money. Don't believe me? Go try it. Seriously, go do it. See what happens. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Outer Zone, the official podcast of Formula Drift. And today we have do you do you have you gotten a nickname yet? Um, I think Jared calls me Brandon Soren Sorensen, but uh, you know that's Soren, that's from Sorensen. Jared. So, yeah, I wasn't sure if you like received one from another series or anything like yet, like that. If you have to like unify the nicknames across every series, yeah, no, normally it's just uh, you know Brandon Sorensen. It's what I'm rocking with. <laughs> at least, uh, at least I got the the pronunciation right. I always bug uh, Jonathan Hurst that he calls you like the Sorensens. Like he like compresses the whole thing down for some reason. Yeah, I'll respond to whatever, you know, it's, it's all similar. <laughs> Just getting used to it. Nice. Yeah. Um, how's everything going, man? How's your off season been? Obviously, you're in the shop and um, I've been trying to keep up on all the building you've been doing. Yeah, you know, we definitely have a lot going on in the shop. We have uh, two cars sitting behind me. We have the 2025 chassis on this side and then my 12 year old brother's chassis on this side. And then uh, we just got home from testing a trophy truck yesterday in California, getting ready to do a trophy truck race. Um, you know, just keeping ourselves busy, staying behind the wheel of everything we can. So, hang on. So you're building a chassis already for next year, not for this season coming up, but for the season after. Yeah. So this is our 2025 chassis that's sitting behind me. We're hoping to have it done by like March and then start getting some testing in. And so, you know, the car is 100% ready to go when we show up to FD. We don't want to be doing this last minute testing that everyone else does. And uh, we want to show up completely prepared. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good call. I think, I mean, I, I think a lot of people wish they could kind of be in that position or should, I mean, realistically at this point, everybody should kind of be thinking two years ahead, not six months, three months, one week ahead, right? Yeah, there's there's no reason to cut it that close. You know, we we have the resources, we have the time right now. So uh, the car that we've been using since 2019 is still holding up strong. So there's no reason to, there's no rush to replace it. So, you know, we're just going to take our yeah. time, build it properly and uh, check all of our boxes. Any any like big like changes or plans with that build or kind of keep it simple and just tweak the shit you don't like? Uh, well, that's why we're working on it now, because we're going to use this chassis and test it as much as we can and uh, use that time to find any big changes that we might want to make. Um, the cars have been proven to be working pretty well so far. So for this year, we haven't found anything that's necessary to change that's major. And so as of right now, it's going to kind of stay the same, but hopefully we'll make some big advancements in this car and find some new things to work with. Hmm. Yeah. No, it'd, it'd be sweet. I mean, you obviously have an absolute rocket ship of a car and I, I mean, I, I'm interested to see what else you can kind of pull out of it. I think the kind of the, the big V8, blown V8, I mean, depending on how you want to do your power routers and then on, in a BMW seems to kind of be the way to go right now. I mean, you could argue the Corvette is is the alternate, like the alternate way, but uh, I, don't, I think there's just too much information on the BMW chassis to ignore it. Yeah, that's, that's the main reason why we went with it. Uh, we worked with Michael Essa in 2019. We've worked with um, a lot of people that are very familiar with this chassis. So as we were coming up, there's no reason to try and build a chassis and a driver at the same time. So we went with something that was proven. And so I could, you know, really get comfortable with everything. And then hopefully within the next couple of years, we can start advancing and, you know, bringing new things into the sport too. Yeah. No, that's that's fair. I want I do want to touch on the fact that your brother's your little brother's getting into it, which that like kind of scares me because that kid's wild. <laughs> like he's dude's crazy, and and yeah. to see him behind the wheel of a drift car is going to be pretty pretty nuts. Yeah, no, he's definitely not scared to send it. Um, we had him out at Utah Motorsports Campus doing testing at the FD track. We did two full days of training with him, and like he's advancing super fast. So 
it's really cool to see and for me to be able to sit there and help him and really guide him in the direction that we need to be going. You know, he's advancing so fast. He has all of us to look up to and learn from. When me and Amanda were coming up, going into drifting, it was like, oh, we'd fail here, fail there, crash there. And just trying to find, you know, what, figure out what we were doing where Cameron, he just got to ask us or we'll point something out to him. And so he's able to progress so quickly. Hopefully we're shooting to have his prospect license in 25. Damn. That'd be, so with that, I mean, would that put him ahead of you? I don't know how, how old is he now? You said he's 12? Yeah. Okay. So I don't think he could beat your record then. It'd be close, but I don't think he could get his pro. I mean, if he basically got pro, like, like pro spec, pro two, and then pro in that succession, uh, yeah, I think it'd be pretty much tied. Just come down to days, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I got, okay. I got my pro two license on my 14th birthday. So <laughs> if he can, if he can get his physical license before he's 14, then he's beating me for pro spec. Okay. And then, you know, I got my pro license at the end of, um, I think I was 15 when I got my pro license. Right. Right. Okay. Is there like any, like, obviously you, the entire family is racing. So like, does that competitiveness like go into that? Like if you already kind of said that to him or do you think that's in his head? Uh, it's, it's definitely in both of our heads. You know, every single time he does something, he's always comparing himself to me and like trying to one up, you know, we're always trying to one up each other and do better. And, uh, you know, he, he loves talking his smack <laughs> for sure. And I keep telling the kid, I'm like, look, you can talk smack when you're better than me, but you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to help you right now. So you know, we're just making a lot of fun out of it and uh, being able to travel with everyone and experience all this. It's just really cool too. Yeah. I, I do kind of like switching back to what you talked to bef about before, like him learning off of you. Obviously your dad coming from, you know, 20 plus years of motorsports that shows immediately, even in this conversation where you're saying like, oh, we're already thinking this far ahead. Like that type of knowledge only comes from somebody who has had a career in motorsports to think that far ahead. And I think that's, you know, one of the biggest things that you and, and the family bring to the table is like just so much motorsports experience where you're like, no, we, we know how to run, uh, you know, a series. The difference is just what discipline we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Amanda and I have been racing since we were what, Five. eight, nine years old. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I was going to say we did, uh, we did start racing go-karts when we were five, six years old and then progressed from there. And Cameron has kind of been in the same position as us too, but he's also been traveling with us and he's seen a lot more things and he's able to experience a lot more things. So just his knowledge around the motorsports basis is already much larger than ours was when we were growing up. And uh, my, yeah, my dad used to race 20 something years ago and he's got like maybe six years under his belt of physical, like racing motorsports experience behind the wheel mm -hmm. in uh, off-road racing. But from there, Amanda and I have really like taken over the team in the last two years once we got with the Air Force. And, um, you know, we're just trying to stay prepared and do the best that we can. So, so as somebody who's basically like born and raised into motorsports, like what's that, what's that like having to kind of like take the reins over from your dad? Like he's still around, I mean, you can, you can always hear your dad in the pits. Like, you know, you know where he's at at all times. So he's still, oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I absolutely love the conversation I get with him too. <laughs> but like, what is that kind of passing of the guard? Like where, you know, he's kind of built you guys into these incredible athletes. And I, I don't want to take anything away from your ability and hard work, but like, it almost seems like he had this focus of like, no, 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 this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a, a winning motorsports family. And now you two kind of have to carry that, that torch. Yeah, no, I mean, I think since we've taken it over, we've definitely done a very good job. Obviously he still has a, a, a big part in it and helps us whenever we need it and wherever he can. But Amanda and I, we, uh, I mean, we want to take pride in something that we are doing. We, we don't just want to show up and, you know, like have everything there for us. We, we actually want to work on this stuff and see something grow into something very large. So mm -hmm. if we can take it to, you know, where it's at now and just scale it and make it, um, you know, what we want it to be, the sky is the limit there. 
Yeah. No, I, I think that's the the right mentality. And I think anybody who doesn't like know you would, would assume it's just like a show up thing. And meanwhile, like, you know, go check any of your socials. You can see literally welding, you know, well into the night to, to get stuff done and, you know, making sure that all of these cars are prepped. I mean, behind you, I mean, it, I, you know, you're, you seem to be constantly wrenching. So it's definitely not an, an arrive and drive program. That's, that's for sure. Yeah, no, my sister uh, carries a lot of the logistics side of the team. And then I do a lot of the mechanical stuff. So, um, you know, I've been engineering these cars. I, I taught myself solid works and how to run like a Haas mill and stuff like that, just because nothing was out there that we wanted. Nothing was out there when we were looking for it. And so we decided to make it ourselves on a lot of parts on these cars. Yeah. And it was just like, we wanted it to be better. So we, we figured out how to make it ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you have to too. And I, I mean, that ownership over the vehicle, I, I wouldn't say like it adds mechanical sympathy because I've seen the way all of you drive and there's no mechanical sympathy there whatsoever, but there's definitely <laughs> no mechanical sympathy when we drive because we know we can come back and press a button on the Haas machine and make it yeah. again. What What's that? I guess like, does that alleviate some of the pressure? Does it add more pressure when you know that you're going to be one of the people repairing it? I mean, for me, I know how much time and dedication that goes into it, but it's like, when I'm driving like that, I, I don't care how much I have to work on it because the harder I drive it, the more fun that I have. So as long as I'm having fun while I'm behind the wheel of that car, I would much rather break it while I'm having the time of my life than sit here and drive it like a grandma and have sympathy for it. I'm not using this machine to its full potential. I'm not having fun in it. Mm, that's a good point. I, I guess... Considering just the amount of motorsports you've been in and and all the different things that you're doing that like the edge is where you would, I guess, like have to live. Mm -hmm. Like it just, I mean, when you're, when your every day is, is kind of above what most people's, you know, dreams and wishes would be, you, you have to ride that edge constantly just to, to kind of get something out of it. I, I would assume. Yeah. You know, we, we, uh. I mean, I guess you could call us adrenaline junkies, but it's like when you're behind the wheel of something, as much as we are, we we enjoy finding that limit of where we can drive it at and, you know, holding it there and finding, once you're on the limit like that, it's it's so niche to find new things of where you can push it, where you have to hold back and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, what, I guess coming from dirt, like how much, how much does that dirt experience translate into drifting like is there anything that comes out of it is it a little bit is it a lot to me seat time is seat time if you're behind the wheel of a car you can learn something no matter what if, if i'm driving a trophy truck and i'm shifting it then i'm still using muscle memory to you know like rev match it and um you know different inputs with the steering wheel and everything it, car control is car control being behind the wheel is just being behind the wheel no matter what but i would say drifting has taught me more um car control and all of that stuff than any other motorsport has there's a lot more that drifting has to offer that you can bring other places versus going to race anything else and bringing it into drifting hmm. okay if, if that makes sense yeah, it, 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 I mean, I, I think there's a lot of different motorsports and disciplines that, that help with drifting, but I do agree that like once you have learned the level of car control needed in drifting, that helps in other motorsports, maybe more than what other motorsports bring into drifting. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Have you, have you ever like, I mean, like even, uh, oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, even when we were testing the trophy truck yesterday, it's like, finding new limits of how hard we can pitch it, how hard we can throw it because it's 7,000 pounds. We have a hundred gallons in the back. So like understanding all of that weight transfer and momentum and everything like that, I can drive a trophy truck into a corner and pitch it a hundred feet before. Sorry about that. <laughs> <It's all good. laughs> but I could drive into a corner and pitch the truck sideways a hundred feet before anyone else can, because I have that drifting experience. Hmm. Interesting. Do you, do you, could you ever see, guys from other motorsports like working more on drifting to then come into it and, and add to it, like maybe something like a trophy truck? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're starting to see it a lot more, you know, at like uh, some of the different drift academies or dirt fish is a really big one where the rally, um, where the rally stuff is 
all of the big off-road guys are constantly out rally racing to practice their skill set and stuff because I think it is closer to what they're doing. But I think most guys don't see where it will help them. But as soon as you get to it and you experience it firsthand, it, it's unbelievable how how much it benefits you in, in other aspects. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder too, like the the level of drifting, like just the amount of horsepower and grip that's in a pro car that like, you know, maybe they've, they've run something on, you know, a set of 205s or 215s and like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But then get them into something, you know, with 295 or bigger. And then it's like, oh, this is, this is now similar to trophy truck level of grip in dirt than, you know, just a, a Miata sliding around or something. Yeah, I mean, when you're racing an off-road, there's a lot of different things that you would never have to account for in drifting, like being able to look at a trail and spot the rocks that are going to pop your tires and avoid them at 100 miles an hour. Or, you know, there's eight different line choices, but if you're racing in a trophy truck and you're on the side of a hill, you're going to pick the line choice that's on the very bottom. Because if you go to the very top, that's where the rain ruts are and it's going to be rougher. Mm. So, I mean, there's a lot in, of different things that don't transfer over at all. But, you know, they're, like like I was saying, if you're behind the wheel of something, you're you're going to be improving everywhere no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Sea time and, and just motorsports experience. I mean, like, like realistically, I, I, as, as weird as it sounds, like I remember when you were coming up, I was, I was working with a Pro 2 team at the time. And like, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, you coming into Pro 2. And, and I was kind of doing the math. I'm like, man, this, this guy's got, you know, at that point, what, like you'd only been drifting for a year or two, but like collective motorsports experience of like six, seven years. I'm like, there's no reason why he shouldn't come in and just decimate everybody here. Like it's similar. Seat time is seat time. And the preparedness of the team, um, some of the mechanics you guys had on staff at that time, or I mean, literally any of the mechanics you guys have had on staff in general, and just the ability to show up as a team and compete. I was like, oh, that's what so much of this sport is missing is that level of professionalism that at that point it was only these large pro teams had had ever really seen so it was a, it was a i think it was a big wake up moment for a lot of people especially in in what was pro two, or pro 2 at the time yeah absolutely all of the motorsports experience helps everywhere and uh you know showing up with a team that is familiar with the car and knows what's going on and is able to diagnose things in a certain amount of time and everything like that, it all plays a role in, you know, the championship or how your event goes, because sometimes we show up to events and, you know, we have part failures, but if we're able to have like make those uh, changes to the car and get it back on track that five minutes, 10 minutes sooner, that's an extra practice lap that we could be improving the suspension setup or anything like that. Yeah. I do think that's the biggest thing that gets missed in a lot of like new builders are, are especially in drifting is like repairability. It's so like, oh, I just got to get this engine. And it's like, okay, have you thought about how you're going to get that engine out and how quickly you can do that or a front clip or, you know, a whole corner of a car like that, those things literally make or break entire weekends. Yeah. And knowing some of that stuff only comes with experience. Mm -hmm. Like when we built our first drift car, it would probably take us two, three hours to pull an engine out. And, um, you know, as you work on it and you go through trial and error, try different things and every single time you're improving it. And so as long as you're trying to improve those things as you're working on it and keeping a mind of how can I make this better? How can I do this faster? What can I change on the car to make it easier to work on? So, you know, throughout the last four years we've been doing that, now we can pull an engine in probably 20, 30 minutes yeah. versus two hours and not make a giant mess of it. And we have a system down and yeah, just everything works out a lot smoother and it all comes back to experience. Yeah. I want to, I want to, you know, change gears, mind the pun a little bit. Um, can you, can you tell me about trying to break the two wheel side by side record? Uh, I, I kind of want to hear this story. Like, why would you even try that? And like, I, I, I mean, I know the ending of the story, but I'll let everybody else learn at the same time. Yeah, no, it was, it was super random. Uh, we've been racing side by sides our entire life and we learned how to drive them on two wheels when we were, but my, my 12 year old brother can, hop in our four seat razor and go around our turn in the driveway and pop it up on two wheels and drive it, you know, however long he wants. 
But for us, learning how to drive on two wheels was really important because if you're on the racetrack, you need to know when you have to bail out. You need to know how long you can ride that line before you're flipping over. And so that it was just to build car control. That's why we taught ourselves how to do that. And then it kind of spiraled into, well, we've kind of gotten pretty good at doing this. I wonder, I wonder like what, what the world record is. And we look it up and it was only like 11, 12 miles. And it's like, well, I, <laughs> I, I could definitely do that. So we, uh, worked with speed Vegas here in Vegas, the racetrack. And I think it was, uh, I don't remember how long the road course was, but I needed to make it 13 or 14 laps around the road course driving on two wheels. And we came up like 0.5 miles short. Like I, I just had to made it, make it to the end of the straightaway and we would have broke the record. But we ended up having our axle like explode. The whole diff like caught on fire. All the oil on it was leaking all over the track. And... Uh. We're, uh, we're probably going to go back and do it again, but no, it was just like a super random thing that we thought of one day and we were like, Oh, let's, let's go do that. And it, it almost worked out, but the car broke sadly ah. because apparently, uh, razors aren't meant to be driven on two wheels. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. It's wild that like, you know, you can only get whatever, 11 miles out of them on two wheels. Right. But the, yeah, the diff yeah. finally just lets go from starvation on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> That's sick though. I mean, I, I think. You you got to do it again. You got to try for it again. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, as long as the car holds up, I feel like I could probably drive like that for two hours minimum. Yeah. The one thing I wasn't expecting is, you know, when you have your helmet on and everything else, when you're sitting on your side and your neck has to hold that helmet up oh. for however many period of time. By the time I like actually got out of the car, it, I I could not even I could barely hold my head up from holding the helmet. You must have, at an angle like that. You have to get a halo seat or something just so you can rest it on on the side, or I mean, get one of those like I'm thinking like those old school neck foam braces. I think uh, yeah, I think that, yeah would, maybe. that would work right. It got to a point where I was just like letting my head hang and the Hans hold it, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no. It, it was definitely something I wasn't expecting to have my neck start hurting like five, 10 minutes into it. But mm. I don't know. It's just, just got to build the neck muscles up more, I guess. There you go. You look like one of the F1 drivers where like they're tiny, but they have these gigantic traps and necks, right? So <laughs> some of the videos of them training where they've got like huge amounts of weights hanging off the side of their head. And then you realize like, oh, that's because, you know, they'll do several G's into a corner. And if they didn't, their head would just smash against the side of the car. Yeah. 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 I, I'm... I'm interested to see if, if FD drivers next start to get bigger over time. Like, I think we should, uh, maybe that'll have to be like the, the next weird thing we look into is the, the size of, of, of the driver's necks over the years if they've gotten bigger. Yeah. And, and off road racing, it definitely takes those muscles because we're doing like three, 400 mile races and you're just sitting there like bouncing around everywhere inside the truck. Like you got to think how rough the terrain is, the yeah. speeds that we're going, like you're just getting beat up and you just got to push through it keep going i i'd heard a story that you had like built a, a heavy rock playlist to stop yourself from falling asleep on some of those long stints oh i don't know about that one. Oh, okay i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to oh check actually my actually i do know what you're talking about yeah yeah i i did uh, i think we were doing the the mint 400 okay and uh we yeah me and my co-driver had like some rock playlist going through the through the headset just uh just to keep us pushing yeah, I can only imagine what that level of endurance is like. I mean, I guess that's the only saving grace with drifting is like it's it's intense, but it is very it's a very short period of time. But I think the endurance is yeah. like more mental. Well, I mean, I guess you know, min four hundred racing. Obviously, like there's a lot of mental endurance too. But like, I, I would think it's almost more nerves in drifting. Like trying to like you've got one shot, right? Yeah, absolutely. In, in drifting, I feel like, you know, you have that like 20 or 30 seconds of your lead run or your 20 seconds of follow run where it's like make it or break it. Mm. And, you know, you're in front of all of these people, thousands and thousands of people. And the more you're outside of the car, the more you're thinking about it and the more you're getting nervous. But as soon as you get behind the wheel, you, you, all you got to do is make it to the first turn. Yeah. And then from there, you, you pretty much know what to do. Where in off-road racing, we're, 
we're not stopping. We're not getting out of the truck. And so it's like 100% concentration the entire time. There's no room for nerves. You're, you're not thinking about that. You're, you're behind the wheel and you're just, you're just pushing. Hmm. Okay. So like just almost two, I, I guess like emotional muscles that you have to work out between the two, right? Like one is that longevity. The other one's more of like, I have to suppress getting nervous because like th- this is it. I've got, I've literally have one shot to, to figure this out. Yeah, I mean, for me, the only time you ever... Are you like 100% reactionary? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, for me, the only time you're ever nervous is when you're not behind the wheel. It's because you're thinking about it. But as soon as you uh, are behind the wheel and that's off of your Mm -hmm. mind, those nerves just go right away. So the biggest thing in drifting is the off time, where if we could be behind the wheel, you know, the entire time, like a, a proper endurance race or something like that, those nerves are never going to kick in. You're, you're so concentrated on driving that it's, it's not really a factor. Hmm. Are you, what do you, what do you do to like combat that? Or do you like, do you still get those nerves now or you, it's just kind of, you know, a day at work at this point? I mean, luckily I've had so much experience. I, I started racing in front of big crowds with high pressure when I was 10 years old in off-road racing and short course racing. We have 15, 20,000 people and it's a 15 minute race. We are racing uh, modified trophy carts. And so, you know, that's, you start to learn how to control your nerves and um, really keep your head space where it needs to be in order to go drive because your head space is everything. At least for me, my head space is everything when I'm going to drive. And if I'm not like completely in my zone, I'm making mistakes and just it's not going well what are, you, what are you doing to get into that space though like are you uh like turn off the radio don't listen to anybody like when i'm at this point don't talk to me that kind of thing yeah absolutely you even ask my team if, if they uh i mean they just know at this point i'm not like turning the radio off but it's like i need to have all of the information i need to know within three four minutes of the battle and i need at least two minutes to myself of just complete silence like getting myself in the zone and then don't talk to me until I'm done with that run. Okay. Is it, do you like, is there like a meditation, a breathing exercise, or are you just like, you're just staring at the track or, or is it, you don't even know, you just kind of like exit body. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, I mean, it's just try and clear your mind and uh, just not think about anything. And your, your body knows what to do. You know what you have to do at, at this point. And so as long as there's no other outside distractions and your mind is just clear, uh, it, it, it helps me a lot. Okay. So just kind of Zen really like just at that point. Yeah. I I started doing it when I was, you know, 11 years old and I, I'd been doing these off-road races for a year and a half at this point. And then someone told me to do it. And I went from like consistently finishing in like 12th place to consistently finishing like top eight, top five. And it was just because when I was on the racetrack, I wasn't thinking about everything else because my head was clear Mm -hmm. when I started. Okay. Yeah. I think, I mean, I, I've always tried to understand like what goes on. I, I, I mean, I've never done anything at that high of a level. So for me, like I don't, I mean, the closest thing I would say is like just me announcing in Utah, but that happened so fast. I felt like it didn't even happen. It was just over. And I'm like, oh, okay, we're done. <laughs> so I guess I did the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely enjoy uh, having you as an announcer because some of the things that you're able to pick up on versus everyone else, it blows my <laughs> mind because most other people's spotters are not paying that much attention to what the cars are doing. Uh, I appreciate it, man. I'm just a, I'm just a nerd that gets to talk. That's it. Like, I just, I get obsessed about the cars and I don't know. I always try and find time to talk to as many people as I can to get as much info. So a lot of time it's easy. It's just like, you know, crew, they see the hat and I walk up and they'll just like start telling me everything. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, well, good luck with that. And then I just have to retain it. That's, that's basically it. So I appreciate that though. Thanks, man. Um, is it, is it true that you still drop a brand new helmet yeah. as soon as you get it? 100%. <laughs> Why? It's mandatory. It, because, well, you see in the dirt bike world, if you don't drop your helmet before you wear it for the first time, then your helmet's going to find the dirt. <laughs> so it's just like a, it's like a big dirt bike thing, I guess. Okay. I've never, I've never actually heard that one before. I thought it was like a, a damage thing. I know a buddy of mine, like he'd get a new car and he would like hit it 
and you'd be like, cool. Like I'm, you know, it's, it's somebody's already hit it. Not bad, but then like, it's over with, I don't have to worry about this thing now. Yeah. I mean, same concept, I guess. <laughs> so of, of all the tracks in the FD circuit, like what are you, what are ones that you like? Maybe, maybe your favorite. And then the track that maybe you wish they would get rid of. Well, the venue of FD Long Beach is by far my favorite, but the track, I wish it was a consistent surface at least, but because it sits as a parking lot for 99% of the year, there's so many inconsistencies in the track that it it just adds extra challenges that most people don't realize. Um, But I would say that's my favorite venue for sure. Um, Other than Atlanta, they are those are my two favorite events. The Atlanta track is really fun. I love elevation changes. Um, coming up the hill, going into the keyhole, it's all blind. So it adds extra challenges there. And it, it really makes you think about it. And you have to be on your marks to do that consistently. And then my least favorite track. I mean, Orlando is, uh, I don't know, It's it's... It's just kind of uh, boring as a driver, I guess. It's, you know, once once you go there a couple of times, it, yeah. it's a really easy track to drive, in my opinion. And I don't like driving easy tracks. I want to challenge. All right. That's, yeah, I think that's fair. I think Orlando pretty regularly kind of ranks low. So I'm not, not, I'm not shocked by that. Or, or Washington. Washington, I'm not a fan of at all. Because you will like sit there on the bank and you're just like, is this thing ever going to end? You just have to, once you set the car in the right position, you literally <laughs> sit there and just hold the steering wheel with your with your foot matted on the gas. And uh, as long as you set it up properly, it, it just gets boring because it, it's just so repetitive and it, it's not, um, it doesn't keep you on your toes, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, when you have that long of a bank too, I mean, unless... Obviously, you make some sort of mistake and you've got to make a correction and then it's like full panic mode. But the downside with it is if you make any mistake on that bank, like you're, you're getting walked one way or another or that guy's basically just in in your door at that point. Look, we can't all make it to FD events. We t- I, I get it. It's tough. I mean, there's a lot of them. There's flights and hotels and all that stuff. But you can still represent by heading over to shopfd.com using podcast 24 at checkout. Save yourself 20 percent. Hats, shirts, bunch of stuff, skateboard decks. I, I mean, they're making new stuff all the time. Good. Make sure to check back off and they do random sales too. I don't know if you knew that. Um, yeah, just, just make sure to check it out. So shopfd.com, maybe when you're scrounging for notes, when you're trying to launch your own podcast about drifting stuff, you know, checking the FD website, all that stuff. But while you're perusing, open another tab, I don't know, whatever browser you're using and, uh, and, and check out some merch. So shopfd.com podcast 24, just the numbers, save yourself 20%. All right. So, uh, I'd heard, I think I saw posts about it. Um, but I definitely heard some, some rumors about it. Are you still going for your pilot's license on top of everything else that you're doing? Um, I actually got my pilot's license already. Uh, in, I think it was the week before FD Atlanta. Okay. So you've had it for a bit now. Are you just going to yeah. start flying to events or? <laughs> no. Um, you know, someone's got to drive the rig and get us there. So that's been kind of my job is driving the rig, you know, coast to coast. And uh, I would I would love to fly us there, but that's a lot of uh, additional costs and everything that it's not really worth it. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I mean, and there's something like, I, I know it probably gets like super monotonous driving the rig, but like, I'm, I'm sure there's something to that as well. Just like having that time to just, you know, travel there, or, you know, get everything ready. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Driving, uh, I personally don't like it at all. No. But I don't really trust anyone else to be driving my truck with my cars in it and with my entire life in the trailer. So uh, I'd rather, you know, just push myself through it and drive it myself than trust anyone else with my entire life. <laughs> that's a that's a fair point. I That's a fair point. Um, I never thought of it that way that, yeah, everything you guys have kind of worked towards is sitting in one vehicle. So uh, yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I, I'm there. With I you. mean, pretty much the last, the last five years of our lives of development and everything, you know, we, we have so many notes in there and just books on books of everything that has happened to the car, everything we've changed, everything that is basically we need for FD and 
know, we, we've spent a lot of time on that and I don't really trust anyone else to carry that stuff. Yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe back it up. I don't know. Take some photos of it, throw it on a drive or something. <laughs> Oh, it is. It is. It's backed <laughs> up, but it's, it's race different. cars, it's, spare yeah. motors, transmissions. Yeah. 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 Is there, I mean, is there, is there anywhere in particular that's just an absolute nightmare to drive with that rig? Anywhere deep on the East coast, for sure. I, I grew up driving everywhere on the West coast where you don't have to worry about low bridges or, uh, New Jersey, you know, <laughs> Tight areas, yeah, 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 exactly. Rest in peace, that my air sister and unit. I. Uh, <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a fun bonding experience for some siblings. A good <laughs> good learning experience. <laughs> oh, that was like the longest thirty two hours of our life. We were driving our rig. I think we were in. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure where we were at, but we had like a six hour drive, seven hour drive down to New Jersey because it was a, a shop nearby. Mm. Well, we made it about two hours, got a flat tire, had to have someone come and uh, put a new tire on the wheel because we had already used our spare. <laughs> and then we made it another two hours and I had to do an entire axle swap on the trailer. So we were in the parking lot of some big parking lot. I think it was a college. And uh, it took me, I think, eight or nine hours to do an axle swap on the semi. It's and I was just, just Amanda and I, you know, I have a spare axle. I know how to do it. I'm not going to call someone to come and do it. And it was just like me laying under there and my sister like fetching tools and stuff whenever I needed them. And then, you know, we hit like, I think there was five or six different bridges that we wouldn't fit under. And then there was one that we thought we might be able to fit under. And, um, apparently we didn't fit. I mean, we were only going like two miles an hour and my sister's like on the outside, like, you're good. You're good. You're good. I'm driving. The smoke detector falls off the ceiling behind me. And I was like, I don't think we're good. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. That's, that's great. Um, I'm sure that was a fun phone call. Be like, Hey, uh, we need new AC. Just not a big deal. I think we should get a new one though. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was definitely an adventure. Yeah. That's, that's, that's where we're going to leave it at. It's a story. I mean, it's, at, it, as my wife says, like it adds to the plot, right? Like when you have those really shitty oh, yeah. experiences, you could like, you know, as long as no one really gets hurt, but like you look back on it and it's just a funny story after it's all done at the time it sucks, but you know, now you can laugh about it. Yeah, I don't know if you were in Irwindale in 2021, I think, if you've seen my uh, full race rig getting towed in by our motorhome into the FD pitch. I, I, did, I believe I did see that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we drove in, had a transmission go out, like four stoplights down the road. And uh, so I hooked up our onboard air compressor that to, you know, air up the tires for the race car, hooked that up to uh, disconnect the parking brakes and stuff and then hooked a tow strap to our motor home and it was like 150 feet of us just rolling down the road trying to make some of those turns and stuff but we definitely have a oh. have a good time and make an adventure out of everything yeah I, I think that's i think that's so important though is just enjoying this whole thing right like just just trying to find some fun in it especially when you get a situation like that right because like what else are you going to do you're going to wait for a heavy wrecker or are you just going to go the extra hundred feet and, you know, double up some toe straps and hope for the best. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're going to make it one way or another. It's just uh, how long it's going to take us to get there and you know, what we are going to have to go through, what kind of story we're going to have to tell at the end of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. So, uh, you're one of, I, I think you're, I mean, Ken Gushi is kind of the only other one that comes to mind, but like somebody who really grew up in the eyes of, of the sport, uh, especially in drifting. Like we've seen drivers grow up in a lot of motorsports, but really you and Ken are the two, which is funny because I think you've beaten Ken twice. Um, but, but how is your perspective of your own growth? Like, how do you, how do you look at that? Like, do you recognize the kid that kind of started this and how do you feel about how you are now, you know, basically becoming, I mean, you're not a teenager anymore. So like, how does that, how do you see that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I think it's really cool to be able to grow up in this industry, and uh, the amount of things that it's taught me is wild. Just you know, basically, uh, like running. It's it's literally running a business, and so it's it's taught me more than I think anything else could have. Even if I would have gone to college or done something like that, which I did not. I I said I want to be a race car driver, <laughs> but. Um, I mean, growing up just inside the sport, it's something to, um, I don't know, it, it holds a pretty big place in my heart. Uh, all of the friends, you know, I've created along the way and always having uh, someone there to give you advice wherever you need it. And I think it, I mean, obviously it's been a huge part of my life and I, I wouldn't change it, but I don't know, it's, it's really cool and I can't really tell you you know anything else because this is how i grew up yeah no that's that's fair like you know you don't have another you know uh perspective because this this is it right like it's very difficult to have a perspective on yeah. on, on that end of things when this is you know just how you went about life i think it's i think it's just fascinating to to be perfectly honest like i don't you are the all you are you and amanda i mean i think i know you a little bit better than than i know amanda but like do, the only people i know that truly grew up with motorsports and and competition just being everything uh i'm i'm not a competitive person like admittedly so it's it's such a huge disconnect for me and so interesting for me to learn when somebody knows almost nothing but competition like you you know you got into like wake surfing and then you're like oh cool i'm gonna you know just start winning those competitions too like this is my hobby and now i you know i did you got like invited to like a world championship at one point too didn't you yeah, I, I I don't remember how old I was, but yeah, we uh used to do a lot of wake surfing. Uh we got com we got sponsored by a company uh Nirvana Surfboards and they're like a pretty large surfboard company and so they uh, tried to push us into a lot of other places as well. But never surfed in the ocean, but we did a lot of surfing behind a boat and uh it turned out I was pretty good at it cuz I spent a lot of time doing it and so we just started just, competing just cuz why not, right? Yeah, like, I mean, have you is, have you ever had a have you ever had a hobby that you didn't get competitive in? Yeah, there's there's a lot of different things where you know I'm not competitive, and to me, if I'm being competitive in order to enjoy it, I have to win. Ah, that's that's where uh, you know the everything. That's what that's what it comes down to. But there's a lot of other things where I enjoy it just because I'm enjoying it, and I'm not trying to win. And if I set my expectation as to go have fun, then I'm going to go have fun. But if I set my expectation <laughs> as being competitive to win, then I'm going to go there to win. And if I don't win, I'm not going to, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm not going to be happy, but I didn't meet my expectation for myself. Okay. And so, you know, me, me and the boys go out golfing all the time and we don't even like keep score. It's just like we're there hanging out, just having a, having a okay. good time. I, I mean, as long as you've got something, I, I do know a few people that are like everything is a competition, no matter what, like it could be, you know, first one to get to the car, that kind of stuff, which is, which is really funny. If you want to see an interest, like I, maybe cause you're in it, you, you don't see it, but whenever you go out with a group of like, especially FD guys, but anybody who's highly competitive, watch to see how quickly they walk to see who gets to the door first. Cause like, as everybody gets closer to the door, everyone starts walking really quickly. And I don't even think you guys know you're doing it, but for me way in the back, Going like, yeah, hey, I'll be there in a second. It's it's hilarious to watch. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a lot of natural tendencies there, I guess. But I I couldn't explain that one to you. <laughs> it's just it's just bred into you guys at this point in time. Like you don't you don't know anything different other than like, okay, if I I got to be first. Like I just I have to do it. So I I don't I don't blame yeah. anybody for it. I just I just think it's it's how it is. So uh, another yeah, I, you, you, I, unfortunately oh I was gonna. I was going to say, I think yeah, you have to ahead. have a, a big disconnect there. It, being competitive 24-7 gets old for me. And so I'm extremely competitive when it comes to drifting and motorsports and stuff like that. But if I go hop on my dirt bike, me and, uh, you know, my friends will like ride next to each other the entire time. And we're just out there cruising, having fun. It's not about, you know, who jumped bigger or who did this, who did that. It's just about having a good time, improving and like hyping each other up. That's good. I mean, at least, like I said, I'm, I'm happy that it's not all encompassing and, and always consuming because, I mean, you, you need a break from it at some point in time. Um, so 
I, I, I'm trying to think of like the best way to, to broach this. Uh, you, you are in an incredibly awesome place, right? Like I, I think growing up in, in the family that you did with resources that you have, how do you deal with people that get pissed off about that? Um, I, I've always come from, I've always had the perspective of like, if any of us had it, we'd be doing the exact same thing. So why are you mad that somebody just has a different start? Yeah, I mean, personally for me, if they want to hate on me, I'm I'm not going to entertain it. It's not going to affect me. I I physically could not care at all. Um, yeah. But I mean, if, if you're going to get mad at someone for being in a position that they were born into or raised with, then it's it's kind of like grow up. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. I'm extremely grateful for all of the opportunities that I've been given 100%. And it's not like, you know, I show up to the track and someone opens the door for me and, you know, puts my helmet on and straps my helmet for me. Like I, you know, I, I still put in the work. I, I do what I need to do. And that competitiveness drives me a lot for sure. Cause you know, I, I want to be advancing. I don't want to sit there clueless. I want to have a wrench in my hand. I want to understand what I'm driving. I want to know how to fix it. Like curiosity is one, you know, I, I love figuring things out, learning new things and stuff like that. But I don't know. For me, it's uh, it's not really a topic that I entertain a lot. And it's just kind of like if someone wants to hate on me, then um, most of the time they have no idea who I am, what I do, anything like that. They just know that the position that I'm in and a stereotype. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted I feel to like for me, it's a lot different and I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you put it that way. Cause like I, I do want to highlight some of that with this episode, you know, really even before asking the question, because I, I do get to see the work that you put in. I am, you know, somebody who follows pretty much everybody in FD on, on socials, including like, you know, crew and team owners and everybody. And like, I, I see the effort that goes in. I've seen it on the track and I think it's, it's really ignorant of people to just be like, Oh, it must be nice. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm sure there are times it's nice, but also, you know, you've, you're changing axles in a, in a college parking lot. You know, you didn't just, you know, it's not like somebody else is driving that rig for you. Right. Like it's, there's, there's still hard work. It's just a different, it's just a different way. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, like I said, it's not something I entertain a lot, the topic or anything like that, but I enjoy, I enjoy all of this and I'm just going to keep on pushing. I don't really care what they say. I'm, I'm here. We've, we've already proven what yeah. we can do. And I mean, at this point I've heard that my sister and I are anomalies because we came into a fresh sport and within three years we were able to go professional um, get uh, a large backed sponsor to where we can do this as a full time job, and build a team out of it. So I mean, a lot of people are put into the same positions as us, but they didn't have the curiosity or the drive or whatever you want to call it to build it into something that, I mean, what it's come to. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's super important just to 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 touch on and and acknowledge as well. Like that that sponsorship is is. I don't, I don't know all the numbers behind any of it, but could easily be the biggest is sponsorship in drifting right now. Like, I don't know the Ford deal, the monster deal, the rockstar deal, like those are all big, but like this is the air force. Like there's, there's <laughs> very few, you know, companies or organizations bigger than the United States air force period. So uh, I, I think that's something that, that maybe gets grazed over quickly. It's like, this this is an incredibly well funded team. I mean, it's that. it's a yeah. huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for for us, and to be able to be working with them and do the things that we do for them. And um, you know, like we were out in New Jersey, we went and visited one of the Air Force bases, and we went and got attacked by dogs, <laughs> and then we went flying with the F twenty two Thunderbirds. And we've just done so many things and it's given us so many life experiences. And we are, you know, we are trying to give back to them everything and more that they are giving to us. And I think that's the attitude that we've always had. That's what has helped us grow so much and build the relationship that we've had with them. I, I think that's really important too, to like highlight 
that you are trying to uh, over reimburse the the financial commitment that they put towards the team because it's like that's one of those things that a lot of young race car drivers or even old race car drivers forget about when it comes to to partners or sponsors is like this is a this is a relationship this isn't a one way street like you still have to do shit like it's not just slapping yeah. a logo on a car and saying thanks for the check like that's how you get one check and and never again yeah i mean i my sister mainly, you know, we and I, we get a lot of questions about sponsorships and everything. And it's like, if you want to be a, a race car driver in today's day and age, then you better know marketing because marketing is what pays you to go drive. It yeah. has nothing to do with the way that you drive the car or anything else. It is literally almost all marketing. There's a lot of companies nowadays. They don't care whether you win, whether you lose. They care about the cool video that you did after. and the relationship that you built with them. Yeah. I I think that's super, super important. That Like winning helps. Don't get me wrong. Like doing well is obviously going to help in that conversation, but the deliverables and, and, you know, your enthusiasm for supporting that brand that's working with you is as important, if not more important than anything else that happens. Yeah. And it comes down to a lot of character as well, because, you know, if, if someone is representing your brand, you, if you, if you owned a company, and you were to have someone else represent your company, their character means everything in that. And so you want them making, you know, good decisions. You don't want them out there uh, making a bad reputation for you. And it's also, you know, like I said, it all comes down to marketing and numbers and tracking those numbers and having something that you can bring to the table. Yeah, no, that's fair. So in the uh, in the in the everlasting debate of tires and drifting, uh, where do you stand on this? Are we have we gone too far? Do we still need to go further? Do we draw it back? Like, w- what's your thoughts on tire size? Well, uh, I think the only reason that anyone would want to go to a smaller tire is to slow the cars down, and I think it takes more skill, more uh, cojones, more. Uh, everything when you're driving a faster, more gripped up car at those speeds within those tolerances. And I say, open it. I don't care. I will drive the car much faster if I need to. (laughs) For me, it it doesn't matter. Um, Whatever. I'll, I'll put a 400 slick on my tire or on my car. And if my axles hold up, I'll run it. (laughs) I wonder what we're going to have to do with that. Like how, like what? What is next in axle technology? Like, is there a sport that we're missing that has axles that that we should be running to to get to that point? Like, what are we missing here? I mean, on my car right now, we run nine thirty CVs, and uh, on our other trucks, we're running like nine thirty four, nine thirty five CVs. So we could go a lot bigger. That that's not a limiting factor at all. I don't think there's any limiting factor right now to make us go faster or put a bigger tire on there. We we have the technology to do it and we have the equipment to do it. It's mainly just, you know, as you go bigger, it's more expensive. Uh, there's more maintenance and everything else. So as far as uh, um, budget wise goes, it's, it's going to go way up if you were to do something substantial like that. Absolutely. Yeah. But driver wise i don't care i will drive whatever <laughs> and I'll, I'll figure out a way to make it work yeah i wonder like if if certain regulations would have to change at that point too like if they said okay cool you can go up to a you know a 355 like that's our new cap right is 355 so like do knuckles now start exploding do like suspension pickup points need to be changed because of that like do we get to a point where it's like okay cool you can now go full tube frame behind the windshield because it's the only way these cars are going to hold together. My personal opinion, I feel like we should be at tube chassis at this point. Um, There's been a lot of different arguments about this, but I'm definitely pro tube chassis. I would already have one if I was able to. Um, I mean, the only reason we stick with the BMW E46 is because of the trailing arm in the rear end. Right. Because, obviously has nothing to do with the way that it looks because it, it doesn't look like an E46. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's got a, it's and, like an E92 um, front end on it, doesn't it? So it's it's 
essentially got an M4 front bumper, hood, uh, rear bumper. Basically, it's an M4 with a shorter okay. wheelbase mm. at, at this point. I I think you just, you know, maybe like quick phone call to somebody at the Air Force and say, listen, we want to build a full tube chassis drift car just to like show everybody this is what's possible. And then we go from there and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, we we already have the resources to build a tube chassis and we have the manpower to build a tube chassis right now. If it, um, but there's no reason for us to build a tube chassis because all of our spare parts right now are E46s. All of our chassis right now, you know, we, all of our parts are interchangeable at the moment. That's why we're building two more E46s of identical. But if we were able to go to a full tube chassis, then, I mean, we would probably scrap all of this and build something that is a million times better. Do you, do you think you could take a, like a, a, an off-road truck tube chassis and then obviously like lower the suspension, throw on some sort of angle kit and make that work? Like how far, how much, how much more do you need to do to get it to, to drift really? I wouldn't have to do a single thing and I could show up to FD right now. <laughs> Even with like all that suspension travel, like I, I think I'd maybe stiffen things up a little bit, but. Yeah, I mean, obviously we could do some tuning here and there. It, right. We have a short course Pro 2 truck. At the yeah. moment, it makes 900 horsepower. It has uh, a three-speed trans with a torque converter, but it has a handbrake. Um, it has 68 degrees of front steering. So it already matches the drift car almost. Because when we're off-road racing, we're on super slippery services. We're using all of that angle all the time. And I mean, like it, 900 horsepower has the steering, has a handbrake. Uh, theoretically, I could take it to clutch kickers or whatever. And I feel like I would be competitive in that truck. <laughs> now, mind you, right now it sits with 35 inch tires on it. So I could probably use the same set of tires for uh, <laughs> the entire season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The entire season before I have to change them. You know, if, if we had to regulate the tire, we could probably mod uh, the front spindles <clears throat> and put some smaller rear brakes on it. We could fit drift car tires on it and 100% we could take it drifting. I'm not saying that you have to do it, but I do think you should do it. <laughs> yeah, when we were at uh, LS Fest, we tried to get permission to take it out on the, on the drift course, but they... Uh, we're not very fond of that idea. I don't know why. I, it's hey, just rubber on the track, man. Like, what's the difference, right? They, yeah, pretty they much. Had, they had uh, the RTR rig out at SEMA doing it, so I I failed to see what the difference is at this point. Yeah, I think there was a couple like safety issues with other cars <sighs> being on the track too, because it's so much larger. I don't know what it was. Yeah. I guess, yeah. It probably weighs a little more. Maybe rollover risk. I don't know. Whatever. It's a tube chassis. It's fine. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, I think that'd be sick. I mean, I, I've said it before that, like, I would love for FD to get to a point where, <clears throat> you know, you have to do a pit stop in between each run. You do a lead run. You burn through a complete set of tires. You come back around. The pit stop is part of it. And then, you know, you have a certain amount of time to get to the line and get set. And the faster you can do that, the faster you can, you know, get the car there. That, that's my opinion. I, I, I want to see it get to that point, but obviously like the funding and everything else has to, to follow suit. But also, is it one of those, like once it becomes such a spectacle that that funding then starts to come into it because of how crazy things get? Yeah, I, I don't think doing something like that would change a whole lot to what it is now. Mm. I mean, as of right now, uh, at the speeds that we're going a longer track would be nice. Personally, I could use a longer track. I'm not 100% using all of the tires. And so we could go to a longer track and I would be fine. I'm not sure about everyone else. But I think where the sport is at right now, it's in a pretty good position as far as tire wear and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I, I, like I said, I, I, I do think this is one of the best eras of drifting. I'm, I'm super pumped with 
how everything is going right now. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see what the next big change will be. Uh, I know earlier on, you kind of mentioned that too, that like as you and Amanda more or less developed the program, there were some things that you were potentially hoping to, to bring into it. Like, is there, is there any predictions that you have that you could see drifting or FD in general, you know, change in the next couple of years? Um, I think a, uh, like 20 year rule maybe wouldn't be a terrible idea. Uh, you know, you gotta have a chassis that's newer than 20 years, which is a very large window. And I think it's going to help elevate the sport and bring new attention to it uh, from a lot of different markets. Because as of right now, like you said yourself, there's Basically, everyone is driving an E46 with an LS in it. And yeah. I think as soon as you know, we, we're getting more and more and more, and we need to create some kind of diversity, and we need to start developing new chassis one way or another. I mean, there's, you know, Osbo has his Supra, and there's a couple new Supras. There's, you know, some 86s and stuff. But if we could get most of the field into something new, I think it would open a lot of different doors for a lot of people. I do. I do like the idea of the, the trickle down of that to into the lower levels or into grassroots that like, if that is enforced, you would see more development at the FD level or, or even just in drifting in general for these newer chassis. Cause like, that's kind of the complaint right now is like, Oh, like what's the next, what's the next chassis? Is it going to be the, the 400 Z? Is it going to be, you know, the Corvettes or whatever. And it's like, well, maybe it could be the Kia Stinger, right? Like that's a, that's a chassis that people have kind of just looked over, right? Like, but if you had that rule, you might see somebody jump into a a Kia Stinger per per se. Yeah. I mean, I think you would see things that you wouldn't even think of right now. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I now I'm like racking my brain for rear wheel drive cars of the last 20 years. Personally, I'd love to see like some more Mazdas in because I'm uh, one of those weird Mazda people. Um, but like they had some all wheel drive, you know, Mazdas that you, you could convert. That's that's in the rules. So why not? Yeah, I mean, I, I was a huge fan of that Aston Martin when it came over for sure. And I mean, you have to think the Aston Martin, you know, he didn't have the best finishing results, but the amount of exposure and media coverage that he got simply because he was in an Aston Martin. Think about how many new eyes that brought to the sport and how many different companies potentially saw that just because he was in an Aston Martin. Where it's like you can expand that throughout the entire sport. It's going to elevate it. Huge. Yeah, I would would love to to see more of that. I mean, there's there's a couple of people that that, that got announced. I think, I, I don't know plans. Like this isn't me, you know, like announcing anything, but... Um, during that FD roster announcement, the one name that I think way too many pe- people passed over was Bagsy out of the UK. Cause that dude will do weird chassis. So I'm like, okay, is this an opening for another crazy build to, to come into the series? Cause like, I don't know. I, I don't know him at all, but I get the feeling that like he just doesn't give a shit. He's like, I'm here for the show. So let's, let's put on a show. Well, I mean, that's, that's what we're all there to do is to put on a show. And, the great thing about drifting is the diversity of it and having an Aston Martin next to a 25 year old BMW or, you know, a Mustang versus an RX eight or anything like that. You're not really going to find that anywhere else in a sport, like in yeah. a motorsport. And I mean, just advancing those cars, it's 2024 right now. And we're driving cars that are from, you know, 1990, yeah. whatever. We, we need to elevate that at some point. Yeah, I, I know there was talks about it for a while, but I mean, maybe we just see what Kevin does or, I mean, drifting as a, as a whole does. I, I do, I do I, I, as much as like, I, I'm kind of torn on it because like you saw how well Odie and Simon and Ben did in a chassis that would have been outlawed under those rules. But would they have done as well in a different chassis? Like, I don't know, right? Like it, it would mix up a lot of shit, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, you just I take a look at uh, Matt Sopa's, what does he have, A uh, the Ford? Fusion. Yep, a yeah. Ford Fusion. You know, it, that car works, and I think there's a lot of potential where you can see cars like that everywhere else. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think they may have to, like, open it up to 
allowing, I'm trying to think if the Fusion ever came all wheel drive. I know the Taurus did. It was like the SRO version or something like that. That was like the cop car. They were all wheel drive. They're like twin turbo V6, all wheel drive. Like that could be sick. I don't know. More weird chassis. That's all I want. I just want I want different chassis. Yeah, and I think to to keep it fair under rules like that, I mean, you have to look at some of these guys. They've been in an S chassis since before I was even born. They've been developing and driving an S chassis. <laughs> so, I mean, if, how how if, often do you how often do you use that? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say very often, but it, it I I could use it a lot <laughs> if I really wanted to. I think you should. I think that's like a, I, I think you're overlooking the fact that you'd be like, you know, that chassis was built before I was even born. Like pulling that in a driver's meeting. Damn. I that'd did. Be hilarious. Um, there's, there's definitely one driver's meeting where I could have pulled it. And um, that was when <laughs> JR got his tech slip from his very ever first drift event. And I think it was in 2003. And I was like, yep. Right. That was one year before I was on this planet. <laughs> That piece of paper is older than you are. That's incredible. And he was already filling out tech slips. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you got to use it. You got to use the age to your advantage, man. Uh, I'm just, there's, there's gotta be some more ways, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's funny. You should, I, we, we need to get an interview. With yeah. You. I mean, I think I'm, a, I'm starting to lose that advantage now. Yeah. You're practically, but, an old you man. know, with the, our 12 year old brother coming in, getting there. Um, and so uh, yeah, part part of my my fun research is getting to to internet creep you guys a little bit, and I did notice some some hockey photos, and there has been a recent conversation solely from me uh, about getting a hockey game going between all the FD drivers. So are are you in? Like, would you would you be down for that? I'm fairly I'm fairly certain. I feel like I would win that. <laughs> um, I'm pretty pretty confident I would actually. Damn. Okay. This is this is getting heated, man. Because like, Derek Madison hit me up about it. I know. What, what, is this is this on ice? I I don't know. That might be tough. I mean, I would be down for ice. Like, I I have gotten very much back into hockey this year. So like, I'll be the goalie. You guys can all shoot. That's fine. Or we can just do like in the pits road hockey. I'm I'm cool either way. I mean, we play ice hockey. That's that's where I'm. Uh, you know, I'm doing pretty good there. But road hockey. All right. Uh, my my strongest skill is skating. Not as good. So yeah, we'll see. Okay, I uh, I'm trying to think of how, where we could line this up that would work out, and we could still like. Do you know anywhere in Utah that during that event would still have an ice pad open? We could we could figure out. I don't know. No, ah, damn. Maybe somewhere in California. It's got to be somewhere in California around Irwindale. Like I'll, I'll be happy to fly all my gear out to go play. Like that is that's an easy, you know, over oversized. Bug, I feel like female. almost every FD driver goes to uh, PRI, and I'm sure there's bound to be a frozen lake around there somewhere. That's a good point. That especially because it's after the season, so that could get real deadly. Like everybody does the go kart thing, and that's great and all that shit. But I think I think we rent out an ice pad, and everybody goes and plays a game of pickup hockey. That'd be that would be wild. Yeah, I, uh, just to give you an idea, I was so serious about hockey, I figure skated for a while to get better at skating. I, I also did that. I did I did one year of, of figure skating to get my, <laughs> my skating up. So I'm, I'm there with you. I get it. Hey, it helps. It helps a ton. Oh, it does. It does. <laughs> Sick. All right, cool. I'll put you down. Um, so it's it's you, Rome, uh, Derek. I think Ula is in. I, 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 I said to, to Derek, I have a feeling that like, that like Osbo is just going to be good at it too. Like any of the Norwegians, you know, I think it's kind of bred into them as well. Yeah. I don't know if James Dean can skate though. There's only one way to find out. <laughs> this is true. Put this him on true. a pair of ice skates. Oh man. I really, I think that would make it so much better. Is like if we have somebody like you just like crushing and then James Dean, like barely able to stand on skates all in the same pad at the same time. I think that would be incredible. Like it's like those cartoons where like the play goes one way and he's just trying to get up and then the play goes the other way and he's yeah, anyways. I've got a whole vision of how this is gonna look. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck. Um so any any major plans for the season? Like any any big updates to the car? Any anything else you 
want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I think last year worked really well for us. The last three, I want to say last four events, we didn't have a single mechanical issue. Everything went extremely smooth. And so at this point, we know what parts are going to break when and when we need to replace them. So I think we can come into this year completely prepared with out any huge changes. And I mean, obviously the goal is to win a championship. And I think after, um, you know, driving the way that I did in Irwindale and driving the way that I was in Utah until I decided to fling myself off the track. I don't know what happened there. But I think, you know, after the the last few events, we've proven that we're here and we're a serious contender. And as long as everything can stay at this rate, we still have Mike Kojima, who is a huge help and a genius. And so try and keep everything the same the way it was the last couple events when it was running perfect for us and hopefully just continue that momentum. Yeah, I think I think Mike is like, I, I think that was one of the best acquisitions you guys have made. Like he is, he is scary smart, which is fun. Like, cause when you talk to him, he's like kind of goofy. Like you wouldn't expect him to be as knowledgeable as he is just on his like demeanor. Cause he's kind of like this, like lackadaisical, like happy, funny guy. And then you get talking to him and then you just see this like light switch and you're like, Oh shit. You're like, you, you understand this at a level that most people don't. Yeah. I mean, he, definitely under, understands it at a level that I've never seen anyone understand some things before. Like <laughs> when it comes to suspension and setting up shocks, he's like talking about words I've never even heard of. And I'm just like sitting there <laughs> trying to learn everything I can and comprehend what he's saying. I remember a grid life and it was Steph Papadakis and Mike Kojima arguing about suspension changes on Corey Hosford's car. And it was one of the funniest conversations ever because like all three of them have very different personalities and they're all having this conversation about how Corey should be setting his car up. And I'm just like standing there trying to absorb it all. I'm like, same thing. They're saying words I've never heard before. I'm like, oh, okay, like for sure. <laughs> yeah. And he starts like writing some things down on a notepad sometimes. And he's like, do you understand this and this and this? And these numbers mean this and this means this over here. And I'm just like... <laughs> Does that mean we go faster or slower? <laughs> like, <laughs> sometimes it's so far over my head. You just like get humbled so quickly sometimes. Yeah, it's it's good though. I mean, I think that's... But he's, yeah. he's a great asset to have and the amount I've learned off of him is uh, is huge. And hope, uh, sorry, not hopefully. Luckily, he's, he's coming back with us again. Sick, sick. No, that's uh, that's good. I think that's that's a huge, huge asset to the team. So I'm... Um, I'm very curious to see what this year looks like for you just because of that development, what you guys have learned and like already getting ahead on the next chassis, which I think kind of gives you a bit of a playground too, to be like, oh, as you're building that chassis, to like look at certain things and then be like, we could change that on the car now, like if we wanted to, like having that blank slate there that you can kind of almost prototype off of for the, for the current car. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sick. Cool. Um, Anything else you do you want to cover or go over, man? I don't know. I mean, I think I think we talked about a lot in that one. Yeah, that's not bad. Well, I'm I'm super pumped to see what this year looks like for you. I mean, I, I agree. You the the last half of that season and and I mean, there, you've had noticeable improvements. You've had some crazy successes. I mean, Irwindale 2022 was you were absolutely on fire. Like it's there. It's all there. And I think it's a mix of of that preparedness and experience and, 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 and unfortunately a lot of luck. Like, I, I don't think people talk enough about how much luck you need in, in all motorsports, but especially this one. Yeah, no, 100%. Things, things pop up out of nowhere so quickly and uh, at the worst times every single time, at least yeah. that's my experience because it's like car will run just fine all day on practice. And then we'll go into the second day of practice two two runs before the battle. And it's like, our gasket goes bad on our supercharger. If you, if you heard my car in Washington, it was sitting there idling at like 5,000 yeah. RPMs because something messed up in between the supercharger and it had a huge leak. So I wasn't building boost and the car was idling so high. It was like 250 degrees 
<laughs> and it's just like, well, I'm here. I, whatever. I got a spare motor in the trailer, but it's, it's, I got to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who don't have time to do anything. I, I mean, that's what has to be done, right? Like that's, that's it. If you're going to compete, you, you have to make that, that sacrifice. Like, do I waste a five minute time out or do I just give it like, we're not going to fix this in five minutes. So let's just go and see what yeah. happens. And worst case, you throw another engine in it. Yeah. Yeah. So sick. Well, dude, I, I really appreciate the time. I'm, I'm glad we finally got to, uh, to do this and, uh, yeah, I'll see you in a couple of weeks, man. We're not, we're not that far out. So, um, get your rest and enjoy the dunes. Oh, I know. And- Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready. You're fine. You're good. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Sick. Well, uh, thanks. No, we, we got a, we got a, we got a new trailer for this year. We're setting up our new awning right now. That's what the noise was earlier. If you heard yeah. it. And so we got like a proper NASCAR style trailer now with, uh, you know, way more room in it, way more tools, way bigger, uh, carrying capacity. So we're able to bring more spares and be more prepared. So, you know, we got that getting worked on right now. Got a trophy truck race next week and then prep for, prep for Long Beach. Damn. Well, I, uh, I'm looking forward to, to getting the tour of the new rig. Um, that sounds pretty sick. So hopefully that means less blown tires and blown axles and, just a better season overall. So, um, yeah, thanks, man. I, I do, yeah. I do really appreciate it. Um, for everybody listening and, and watching at home. Uh, yeah. Thank you for subscribing. Make sure to share this episode. Um, yeah. And, uh, we'll, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, dude.